Cambridge International Examinations International General Certificate of Secondary Education Specimen Paper 4 for examination from 2019 English as a Second Language Extended Tier Listening Comprehension Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, centre number and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the exam. If you would like the recording to be louder or quieter, tell your teacher now. The recording will not be stopped while you are doing the exam. Teacher, please give out the question papers and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the recording back on. Now you are all ready, here is the exam. Exercise 1 You will hear four short recordings. Answer each question on the line provided. Write no more than three words for each answer. You will hear each recording twice. Question 1 A. Why will the train have to stop? B. How will the passengers complete their journey? Good morning. This is your train driver speaking. We have a small problem. Some cows have escaped from their field and walked onto the railway line about 10 kilometres ahead. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop at the next station and all passengers must get off the train. A bus will take you the rest of the way into the city centre. The bus will be waiting by the taxi rank. I apologise for any inconvenience this may cause. Good morning. This is your train driver speaking. We have a small problem. Some cows have escaped from their field and walked onto the railway line about 10 kilometres ahead. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop at the next station and all passengers must get off the train. A bus will take you the rest of the way into the city centre. The bus will be waiting by the taxi rank. I apologise for any inconvenience this may cause. Question 2. A. Why will everyone have a day off next week? B. On what date might there be an extra day off next year? Here are the news headlines. The government has announced that next Monday, the 27th of September, will be the usual public holiday for the whole country. This is in honour of the King's 70th birthday, which falls on that day. Next year will be the 40th year of his reign. There are high hopes that there will be an extra public holiday then, on June the 1st, to mark that occasion. Meanwhile, all of us working here at the TV studios would like to wish His Majesty a very happy birthday. Here are the news headlines. The government has announced that next Monday, the 27th of September, will be the usual public holiday for the whole country. This is in honour of the King's 70th birthday, which falls on that day. Next year will be the 40th year of his reign. There are high hopes that there will be an extra public holiday then, on June the 1st, to mark that occasion. Meanwhile, all of us working here at the TV studios would like to wish His Majesty a very happy birthday. Question 3. A. What are the friends looking forward to in the film? B. Where in the cinema will they sit to watch the film? I'd like six tickets for the film Moonflash, please. 
as close to the front as possible, so we can enjoy all those special effects we've heard about. I'm sorry, sir, but we don't have many tickets left for this performance. I can manage two groups of three seats, but one group is in the back row. I've got a group of six seats together, but they're right at the back too. Is that any good? No. We really want to be close to the action. Well, I can manage six seats together in the front row, but that's for the next showing at eight o'clock. Great. I'd like six tickets for the film Moonflash, please. As close to the front as possible, so we can enjoy all those special effects we've heard about. I'm sorry, sir, but we don't have many tickets left for this performance. I can manage two groups of three seats, but one group is in the back row. I've got a group of six seats together, but they're right at the back too. Is that any good? No. We really want to be close to the action. Well, I can manage six seats together in the front row, but that's for the next showing at eight o'clock. Great. Question four. A. What kind of shoes does the boy want? B. What two colours are available? Excuse me. Can I try on a pair of running shoes, please? I'm training for a major competition, so they must be of top quality. Yes, of course. What size? I usually take a size eleven, but it depends on the make of shoe. It can be a size ten. I'll get both from the storeroom. Any particular colour? Um, not too bright. Not yellow or orange, and not white. They show every mark. I'll go and see what we have in your size. It'll be a question of either blue or red. Either will be fine. Thanks. Excuse me. Can I try on a pair of running shoes, please? I'm training for a major competition, so they must be of top quality. Yes, of course. What size? I usually take a size eleven, but it depends on the make of shoe. It can be a size ten. I'll get both from the storeroom. Any particular colour? Um, not too bright. Not yellow or orange, and not white. They show every mark. I'll go and see what we have in your size. It'll be a question of either blue or red. Either will be fine. Thanks. That is the end of the four short recordings. In a moment. You will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise two. You will hear a talk about a tree called the baobab tree. Listen to the talk and complete the notes below. Write one or two words or a number in each gap. You will hear the talk twice. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our park and our very special collection of trees from all around the world. The subject of my talk today is this strange-looking tree that you see here in front of you. It is known as the bottle tree in some parts of the world. Elsewhere, people call it the upside-down tree because of its short, stubby branches looking rather like roots. In some countries, because of the shape of its huge seed pods that dangle from the branches by long, thin stems, it is known. As the dead rat tree, if you come back later in the year, you'll be able to see these seed pods for yourself and decide if it's an appropriate name for the tree or not. We prefer to call it by its more common name, the baobab. 
The baobab grows in lots of countries in arid conditions and survives by storing water inside its trunk. The trunk can swell up enormously and store up to 120,000 litres of water. You can see in this tree how the trunk is really fat and shaped like a bottle, not at all like any of the other trees we have here. Baobabs generally can reach heights of about 30 metres, but this one, at 15 metres, is just a baby by comparison. To give you an idea of how big they can become, the largest baobab has a circumference of about 34 metres and grows in South Africa. Now, you may be interested to hear how these giant trees have been hollowed out, with most of the inside of the trunk cut out, so that they can be used for a wide variety of different purposes. In Australia, for example, one was actually used as a prison. I'm glad to say that it is not used as this anymore. Baobabs have also been used as shops in the past. Nowadays, however, a baobab is often used as a bus shelter, which people appreciate because it provides shade when it's sunny and protection when it rains. The baobab is a very useful tree in many ways. Its fruit, for example, is remarkable. It's about the size and shape of a coconut and weighs around one and a half kilograms. You can eat it. Its flavour is somewhere between grapefruit, pear and vanilla, and it's used as an ingredient to add flavour to porridge and drinks. It can also be squeezed out to produce vegetable oil. But it's not just the fruits that are useful. The bark is used for the manufacture of baskets, and the flower pollen can be made into glue. This amazing tree has another name, the Tree of Life. And when you think how it can create a complete ecosystem supporting the life of many animals, you understand why. Birds nest in the branches. Bush babies and fruit bats sip at the nectar and pollinate the flowers. Baboons eat the fruit. Elephants can eat the bark. Then think of the many ways humans use this tree. Some experts believe it may even have medicinal qualities. Yes, I think this is the best name of all, the Tree of Life. Does anybody have any questions? Now you will hear the talk again. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our park and our very special collection of trees from all around the world. The subject of my talk today is this strange-looking tree that you see here in front of you. It is known as the bottle tree in some parts of the world. Elsewhere, people call it the upside-down tree because of its short, stubby branches looking rather like roots. In some countries, because of the shape of its huge seed pods that dangle from the branches by long, thin stems, it is known as the dead rat tree. If you come back later in the year, you'll be able to see these seed pods for yourself and decide if it's an appropriate name for the tree or not. We prefer to call it by its more common name, the baobab. The baobab grows in lots of countries in arid conditions and survives by storing water inside its trunk. The trunk can swell up enormously and store up to 120,000 litres of water. You can see in this tree how the trunk is really fat and shaped like a bottle, not at all like any of the other trees we have here. Baobabs generally can reach heights of about 30 metres, but this one, at 15 metres, is just a baby by comparison. 
To give you an idea of how big they can become, the largest baobab has a circumference of about 34 meters and grows in South Africa. Now, you may be interested to hear how these giant trees have been hollowed out, with most of the inside of the trunk cut out, so that they can be used for a wide variety of different purposes. In Australia, for example, one was actually used as a prison. I'm glad to say that it is not used as this anymore. Baobabs have also been used as shops in the past. Nowadays, however, a baobab is often used as a bus shelter, which people appreciate because it provides shade when it's sunny and protection when it rains. The baobab is a very useful tree in many ways. Its fruit, for example, is remarkable. It's about the size and shape of a coconut and weighs around one and a half kilograms. You can eat it. Its flavor is somewhere between grapefruit, pear and vanilla, and it's used as an ingredient to add flavor to porridge and drinks. It can also be squeezed out to produce vegetable oil. But it's not just the fruits that are useful. The bark is used for the manufacture of baskets, and the flower pollen can be made into glue. This amazing tree has another name, the Tree of Life. And when you think how it can create a complete ecosystem supporting the life of many animals, you understand why. Birds nest in the branches. Bush babies and fruit bats sip at the nectar and pollinate the flowers. Baboons eat the fruit. Elephants can eat the bark. Then think of the many ways humans use this tree. Some experts believe it may even have medicinal qualities. Yes, I think this is the best name of all, the Tree of Life. Does anybody have any questions? That is the end of the talk. In a moment, you will hear exercise three. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 3. You'll hear six people talking about living in the city and in the countryside. For each of speakers 1 to 6, choose from the list A to G which opinion each speaker expresses. Write the letter in the box. Use each letter only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. Speaker 1. I've lived all my life in the country, first as a child, then as an adult, farming the land. I married someone from the same village, and we set up a home here. All our family members are here in this same village. None of us has moved away. Now I'm retired. I no longer work as a farmer, but I still live here. I'm much too old to want to try anything different. The city life is not for me, although some friends tell me it would be much more convenient. Speaker 2 There is nothing to do here in the evenings and at weekends. School is okay, you have your friends around you and it's fun, but outside school, oh, it's so boring. It's okay if you like long, quiet walks, I suppose, but I don't. I like going to cafes, the cinema, shopping, all the things that only the city can offer you. But I shall have to wait until I finish my exams. 
I want to go to college in a city. That's my aim. And I won't be coming back if I can help it. Speaker 3 I want to move out of this city. The noise, the dirt and the fumes from all those cars and buses are absolutely awful and they're getting worse. When I visit my friends who live in the country, I'm so jealous. They can walk in the fresh air and just relax. I'm sure they have fewer colds and illnesses than we get where we live now, always being in hot, confined spaces like buses, trains and offices with hundreds of other people. I just hope I can fulfil my dream one day, <laughs> but it seems rather unlikely, I'm afraid. Speaker 4 I live in a tiny village in the country. We're about 30 kilometres from the nearest town, let alone a city. Don't get me wrong, I loved the city where we lived. I have a real passion for history, and I loved visiting all the museums and exhibitions. But now, well, I landed a dream job. I'm the manager of an old castle. I run the visitor's centre and give talks about the castle's thousand-year history. This more than makes up for what I'm missing, believe me. Speaker 5 I've just retired from my job as a city banker. All my working life I've lived in the city. I had to, you see, because of my work. And my wife worked in a city bank too so it made sense for us to live in a flat close to where we worked. But now, at long last, we have moved into the countryside. We enjoyed our work, but now we are pleased to be far away from all the hustle and bustle of city life. Speaker 6 We moved here, my husband, children and I, into the city about ten years ago. We decided our children would have a better way of life, more activities, but even more because we wouldn't have the problem of having to drive our children everywhere. The regular buses and trains are so convenient. I think it has suited us all very well, and I don't feel any sadness about leaving our old way of life behind. You know, there aren't any buses at all in the village where we used to live. Now you will hear the six speakers again. Speaker 1 I've lived all my life in the country, first as a child, then as an adult, farming the land. I married someone from the same village, and we set up a home here. All our family members are here in this same village. None of us has moved away. Now I'm retired. I no longer work as a farmer, but I still live here. I'm much too old to want to try anything different. The city life is not for me, although some friends tell me it would be much more convenient. Speaker 2 There is nothing to do here in the evenings and at weekends. School is okay, you have your friends around you and it's fun, but outside school, oh, it's so boring. It's okay if you like long, quiet walks, I suppose, but I don't. I like going to cafes, the cinema, shopping, all the things that only the city can offer you. But I shall have to wait until I finish my exams. I want to go to college in a city, that's my aim, and I won't be coming back if I can help it. Speaker 3 I want to move out of this city. The noise, the dirt and the fumes from all those cars and buses are absolutely awful and they're getting worse. When I visit my friends who live in the country, I'm so jealous. They can walk in the fresh air and just relax. I'm sure they have fewer colds and illnesses than we get where we live now, always being in hot, confined spaces like buses, trains and offices with hundreds of other people. I just hope I can fulfil my dream one day, 
but it seems rather unlikely, I'm afraid. Speaker 4 I live in a tiny village in the country. We're about 30 kilometres from the nearest town, let alone a city. Don't get me wrong, I loved the city where we lived. I have a real passion for history, and I loved visiting all the museums and exhibitions. But now, well, I landed a dream job. I'm the manager of an old castle. I run the visitor centre and give talks about the castle's thousand-year history. This more than makes up for what I'm missing, believe me. Speaker 5 I've just retired from my job as a city banker. All my working life I've lived in the city. I had to, you see, because of my work. And my wife worked in a city bank too so it made sense for us to live in a flat close to where we worked. But now, at long last, we have moved into the countryside. We enjoyed our work, but now we are pleased to be far away from all the hustle and bustle of city life. Speaker 6 We moved here, my husband, children and I, into the city about ten years ago, we decided our children would have a better way of life, more activities, but even more because we wouldn't have the problem of having to drive our children everywhere. The regular buses and trains are so convenient. I think it has suited us all very well, and I don't feel any sadness about leaving our old way of life behind. You know, there aren't any buses at all in the village where we used to live. That is the end of exercise 3. In a moment, you will hear exercise 4. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 4. You will hear a TV presenter talking to Ivana from the Czech Republic who earns her living making puppets. Listen to their conversation and look at the questions. For each question, choose the correct answer A, B or C and put a tick in the appropriate box. You will hear the talk twice. Hello Ivana and welcome to our show. Thank you for bringing along some of the wonderful puppets that you make. Our studio audience is fascinated by them. I'm always pleased to be able to show off my work. <laughs> Perhaps you could start by telling us a bit about the history of puppets. Are they a 19th century invention? No, they've been popular for over 2,000 years. We read about them being used to present plays and dramas in ancient Greece. Aristotle wrote about puppets. Animals and people made out of wood which are moved by strings and levers. Mm. In India, puppets dating from around 200 BC have been discovered. Who likes going to puppet shows nowadays? Well, in the UK, people think of them as children's entertainment, and they sometimes watch puppet shows on the beach in the summertime. <laughs> but you know, puppets are used for adult drama and entertainment all around the world, even today. So, what kind of puppet are you holding? Well, there are all sorts you can have. Shadow puppets, puppets made out of cloth that you wear on your hand like a glove, giant puppets that need four or five people to operate them. But the one I've brought in today is a string puppet. By holding the strings high and moving them, 
I can make her walk. Wow, great. <laughs> and even dance. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> you make her movements look so real. Can you tell us more about how you make the puppets? Are they very difficult to make? Well, it depends. They come in all shapes and sizes, but my approach is always the same. I carve all the body parts from wood, which I then paint. The hands are tricky, particularly when I have to do very small fingers. Mm. But the feet are generally a bit easier, as I can cover those with shoes or boots. <laughs> the heads are the most challenging, as they create the character of the puppet. And I make all the clothes myself by hand. Mm. I've been admiring all the details on this puppet here. She has her own personality. She's a real work of art. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, I never make two the same. Tell me, Ivana, where did you begin this work? I've always had a special interest in handicrafts. At school, when I was 16, I studied textiles and learned how to make clothes. Mm. Then, at the age of 20, I got a job in an animated film studio in Prague. They produced films using puppets. I worked as an assistant, and they taught me how to make puppets and create scenery for the film sets. When I left at the age of 23, I set up a workshop to make puppets on my own and sell them to earn my living. And you're obviously running a very successful business. Who are your buyers? I get lots of inquiries from theatre directors around the world, but I don't sell to them because transport and packaging can be a problem. My puppets are quite big and elaborate, so they are usually hung on a wall in the house like a painting. Mm. I focus on selling to private individuals because art gallery owners don't really see them as serious artwork. Although recently one or two have shown interest, so I'm hopeful that I'll be able to sell to them in the future. Mm, that sounds promising. You clearly love your work, don't you? I really do. Yes, it's true. You see, it's a combination of all the activities I love. I can carve, I can paint, I can sew, I can just let my imagination run wild and create unique puppets. It's so satisfying. I work on my own a lot and I don't get much time for family or friends. I'm lucky that they all understand that I have to work really hard. <laughs> I've seen your website and there seems to be no end to the variety of characters you create. Where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I used to reread the storybooks I enjoyed as a child because some of those characters were so clear in my mind. But now I don't rely on books anymore. Some of my friends suggested using TV characters from soap operas, but I didn't find them very inspirational. <laughs> I get ideas from all sorts of places. I might, for example, walk down the street or past a market stall and quite unexpectedly see someone who catches my attention. <laughs> Ivana, thank you very much for bringing your puppets along and for speaking to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Ivana. Now you will hear the interview again. Hello, Ivana, and welcome to our show. Thank you for bringing along some of the wonderful puppets that you make. Our studio audience is fascinated by them. I'm always pleased to be able to show off my work. <laughs> Perhaps you could start by telling us a bit about the history of puppets. Are they a 19th century invention? No, they've been popular for over 2,000 years. We read about them being used to present plays and dramas in ancient Greece. Aristotle wrote about puppets, animals and people made out of wood which are moved by strings and levers. Mm. In India, puppets dating from around 200 BC have been discovered. Who likes going to puppet shows nowadays? Well, in the UK, people think of them as children's entertainment, and they sometimes watch puppet shows on the beach in the summertime. <laughs> but you know, Puppets are used for adult drama and entertainment all around the world, even today. So, what kind of puppet are you holding? Well, there are all sorts you can have. Shadow puppets, puppets made out of cloth that you wear on your hand, like a glove. Giant puppets that need four or five people to operate them. 
but the one I've brought in today is a string puppet. By holding the strings high and moving them, I can make her walk. Wow, great. <laughs> and even dance. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> you make her movements look so real. Can you tell us more about how you make the puppets? Are they very difficult to make? Well, it depends. They come in all shapes and sizes, but my approach is always the same. I carve all the body parts from wood, which I then paint. The hands are tricky, particularly when I have to do very small fingers. Mm. But the feet are generally a bit easier, as I can cover those with shoes or boots. <laughs> the heads are the most challenging, as they create the character of the puppet. And I make all the clothes myself by hand. Mm. I've been admiring all the details on this puppet here. She has her own personality. She's a real work of art. <laughs> Thank you. In fact, I never make two the same. Tell me, Ivana, where did you begin this work? I've always had a special interest in handicrafts. At school, when I was 16, I studied textiles and learned how to make clothes. Mm. Then, at the age of 20, I got a job in an animated film studio in Prague. They produced films using puppets. I worked as an assistant, and they taught me how to make puppets and create scenery for the film sets. When I left at the age of 23, I set up a workshop to make puppets on my own and sell them to earn my living. And you're obviously running a very successful business. Who are your buyers? I get lots of inquiries from theatre directors around the world, but I don't sell to them because transport and packaging can be a problem. My puppets are quite big and elaborate, so they are usually hung on a wall in the house like a painting. Mm. I focus on selling to private individuals because art gallery owners don't really see them as serious artwork. Although recently one or two have shown interest, so I'm hopeful that I'll be able to sell to them in the future. That sounds promising. You clearly love your work, don't you? I really do. Yes, it's true. You see, it's a combination of all the activities I love. I can carve, I can paint, I can sew, I can just let my imagination run wild and create unique puppets. It's so satisfying. I work on my own a lot and I don't get much time for family or friends. I'm lucky that they all understand that I have to work really hard. <laughs> I've seen your website and there seems to be no end to the variety of characters you create. Where do you get your inspiration from? Well, I used to reread the storybooks I enjoyed as a child because some of those characters were so clear in my mind. But now I don't rely on books anymore. Some of my friends suggested using TV characters from soap operas, but I didn't find them very inspirational. <laughs> I get ideas from all sorts of places. I might, for example, walk down the street or past a market stall and quite unexpectedly see someone who catches my attention. <laughs> Ivana, thank you very much for bringing your puppets along and for speaking to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Ivana. That is the end of exercise 4. In a moment you will hear exercise 5. Now look at the questions for this part of the exam. Exercise 5. Part A. You will hear a man giving a talk about an expedition for young people on board a large sailing ship. Listen to the talk and complete the notes in Part A. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the talk twice.
Hello everyone. This afternoon I've come to talk to you about a great opportunity that's open to every one of you. I work for a company called Great Ship Adventures. We help the personal development of young people aged 12 to 25 by enabling them to take part in seagoing adventures. The company has three large sailing ships known as tall ships. I can see from your faces that many of you think this cannot possibly be for you. Well, listen carefully and I'll tell you more. You don't need to have sailed before or know anything at all about sailing. And we have grants to help anyone who is short of money. We have specially trained workers whose job is his to make sure that everyone can take part safely and have a good time. What happens then? Well, the Great Ship Adventure is a hands-on experience. In other words, you learn by actually doing the job. You'll join the ship for a week-long trip. You'll become an important part of the crew, and this involves so much more than just sailing the ship. It'll include preparing meals, maintaining equipment, as well as cleaning the living and sleeping areas. You'll be divided into teams, and each team's job is to keep watch in turn through the night. You'll have to learn to steer the ship and pull up the sails on ropes. You may even get a chance to climb up the masts and help tie up the sails. Now, the captain will have modern communication systems such as computers, GPS and radar, but you'll be taught how to send messages to other ships using flags, which sailing ships traditionally did. What will you gain? Well, of course you'll learn how to sail, but there's a lot more too. You'll become good at teamwork and you'll develop your communication skills. Believe me, it'll boost your confidence to see how you manage to deal with real-life danger and difficulties. I do hope you'll give some serious thought to joining our next expedition. You'll make new friendships that can last for the rest of your life while seeing new parts of the world. There will be opportunities to work with many people from different cultures with different habits and broaden your horizons in many different ways. If you're interested in joining our next expedition, do take one of these leaflets with more details about how to apply, and please feel free to ask me any questions. Now you will hear the talk again. Hello everyone. This afternoon I've come to talk to you about a great opportunity that's open to every one of you. I work for a company called Great Ship Adventures. We help the personal development of young people aged 12 to 25 by enabling them to take part in seagoing adventures. The company has three large sailing ships known as tall ships. I can see from your faces that many of you think this cannot possibly be for you. Well, listen carefully and I'll tell you more. You don't need to have sailed before or know anything at all about sailing. And we have grants to help anyone who is short of money. We have specially trained workers whose job is his to make sure that everyone can take part safely and have a good time. What happens then? Well, the Great Ship Adventure is a hands-on experience. In other words, you learn by actually doing the job. You'll join the ship for a week-long trip. You'll become an important part of the crew, and this involves so much more than just sailing the ship. It'll include preparing meals, maintaining equipment, as well as cleaning the living and sleeping areas. You'll be divided into teams, and each team's job is to keep watch in turn through the night. You'll have to learn to steer the ship and pull up the sails on ropes. You may even get a chance to climb up the masts and help tie up the sails. Now, the captain will have modern communication systems such as computers, GPS and radar, 
But you'll be taught how to send messages to other ships using flags, which sailing ships traditionally did. What will you gain? Well, of course you'll learn how to sail, but there's a lot more too. You'll become good at teamwork and you'll develop your communication skills. Believe me, it'll boost your confidence to see how you manage to deal with real-life danger and difficulties. I do hope you'll give some serious thought to joining our next expedition. You'll make new friendships that can last for the rest of your life while seeing new parts of the world. There will be opportunities to work with many people from different cultures with different habits and broaden your horizons in many different ways. If you're interested in joining our next expedition, do take one of these leaflets with more details about how to apply. And please feel free to ask me any questions. Part B. Now listen to a conversation between Zara and her brother Mehmet about the Great Ship Adventures talk. Complete the sentences in Part B. Write one or two words only in each gap. You will hear the conversation twice. Hey Mehmet, you didn't pick up a leaflet. I was hoping you would. It'd be great to go on one of those sailing holidays together. You must be joking. I thought it sounded really awful. Too tough for me. Zara, holidays are a chance to play computer games and get plenty of sleep. Not get a load of stress on a boat, thank you. Sounds a nightmare. Surely you don't mind a bit of hard work. It would keep you fit and you'd enjoy the glorious sunshine on the open seas. It'd be fantastic. Just think of it. The night sky, the blue sea. It'd be great. Huh. Stars are all right, but what about storms? The ship tossing about and people being seasick? Oh, not for me. Where's your sense of adventure? We might enjoy it, and the experience would be something to put on our university application forms. We'd visit some new places. OK, so let's book a hotel holiday and go somewhere we've never been before. You know we can't afford that. And it would be a cheap way of getting a holiday. It'd be good for us both. Please, go back and pick up a leaflet and think about it at least. Well, I suppose it would be good to go away. But I've never even been on a boat. Not even a canoe. Anyway, I can't swim and neither can you. I wouldn't mind a luxury yacht, I suppose. <laughs> if you did all the work. But if I was going to do anything on a boat... It would be on a speedboat with my friends. Oh, don't be silly. You crashed your moped that Dad bought you. How do you think you'd manage anything faster? Come on, give it a go. Look, last year I bought you a DVD so you'd come on holiday with us. I'll buy you a new phone so you can send photos to all your friends. If I could afford it, I'd buy you a laptop just so long as you'll come with me. Well... OK, I suppose I can go back and pick up the leaflet, but I'm not promising anything. Fantastic. You won't regret it. Of course, Mum will want to know about the medical arrangements later, and Dad will want to know exactly where we'll be going, so make sure you pick up the maps and the route details as well while you're there. From what I've read, the safety arrangements are really good, so I can't see they'll object. Now you will hear the conversation again. Hey, Mehmet, you didn't pick up a leaflet. I was hoping you would. 
It'd be great to go on one of those sailing holidays together. You must be joking. I thought it sounded really awful. Too tough for me. Zara, holidays are a chance to play computer games and get plenty of sleep. Not get a load of stress on a boat, thank you. Sounds a nightmare. Surely you don't mind a bit of hard work. It would keep you fit and you'd enjoy the glorious sunshine on the open seas. It'd be fantastic. Just think of it. The night sky, the blue sea. It'd be great. Huh. Stars are all right, but what about storms? The ship tossing about and people being seasick? Oh, not for me. Where's your sense of adventure? We might enjoy it, and the experience would be something to put on our university application forms. We'd visit some new places. OK, so let's book a hotel holiday and go somewhere we've never been before. You know we can't afford that, and it would be a cheap way of getting a holiday. It'd be good for us both. Please, go back and pick up a leaflet and think about it at least. Well, I suppose it would be good to go away. But I've never even been on a boat. Not even a canoe. Anyway, I can't swim and neither can you. I wouldn't mind a luxury yacht, I suppose, <laughs> if you did all the work. But if I was going to do anything on a boat, it would be on a speedboat with my friends. Oh, don't be silly. You crashed your moped that Dad bought you. How do you think you'd manage anything faster? Come on. Give it a go. Look, last year I bought you a DVD so you'd come on holiday with us. I'll buy you a new phone so you can send photos to all your friends. If I could afford it, I'd buy you a laptop, just so long as you'll come with me. Well, OK. I suppose I can go back and pick up the leaflet. But I'm not promising anything. <laughs> Fantastic. You won't regret it. Of course, Mum will want to know about the medical arrangements later, and Dad will want to know exactly where we'll be going. So make sure you pick up the maps and the route details as well while you're there. From what I've read, the safety arrangements are really good, so I can't see they'll object. That is the end of exercise 5 and of the exam. In a moment your teacher will collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, please collect all the papers.